Hi, it's Fraser here. As regular listeners will know by now, Spiked's podcasts, essays, articles, and videos are free in every sense of the word. Spiked exists to fight for freedom. And in 2020, freedom has never been more threatened. Lockdown threatens our right to free assembly and free movement, while cancel culture and identity politics threaten our right to free speech and free thought. Democracy, that most important right of a free people, is similarly under siege. Spiked wants to challenge these illiberal and authoritarian trends, but we can't do it without your help. It's donations from our listeners and readers that allow us to keep up these fights and to take our message to a growing audience. So, if you haven't already, please consider making a donation to Spiked. One-off donations are fantastic, but regular donations are even better. Just £5 per month can make an enormous difference to our work. Donating to Spiked is really easy to do. Just go to our website at spiked-online.com and hit the red donate button in the top right corner. That's spiked-online.com and the red donate button in the top right corner. We cannot thank you enough for your support. Now, on with the Spiked podcast. Hello and welcome to the Spiked podcast. I'm Fraser Myers, and with me this week, we have Spiked columnist Ella Whelan. Hi. And filling in for Tom Slater this week, we have stand-up comedian, satirist, and Spiked columnist Andrew Doyle. Hello. Andrew is also host of the podcast Culture Wars with Andrew Doyle. The next episode will be out next week. Andrew, could you tell us a bit about the show? It's still relatively early days. We've had some really good guests, and what, what we tend to do is talk about all the things that are going on in the world from that more culture wars angle, but not just the culture wars, but culture more generally. And we try and basically navigate our way through what the hell is going on, given that this is the year where everything has sort of exploded and gone a bit mad. And I think it's much needed. Brilliant. Thanks, Andrew. Coming up on this week's Spike podcast, David Starkey's police investigation, the Great Barrington Declaration, and Twitter's war on anti-woke satire. The police are getting involved in a conversation between a Brexit blogger, Darren Grimes. On suspicion of stirring up racial hatred and the comments made by historian David Starkey in a controversial interview. I was contacted by the Metropolitan Police and told that if I didn't attend a voluntary interview with them, I'd be arrested. And I think it does sometimes have to involve the police, in some cases, prosecutions. The historian David Starkey has revealed this week that he's being investigated by police for comments he made on a YouTube show hosted by Conservative campaigner Darren Grimes. At the time, back in the summer, Starkey's remarks were widely denounced as racist. He himself acknowledged that they were deplorably inflammatory. He was dropped by a number of academic institutions and his publisher, and most thought that that would be the end of the matter. But last week, Darren Grimes was told he was under investigation for inciting racial hatred under the Public Order Act, a crime which can lead to a sentence of seven years in prison. Starkey revealed that he was also facing investigation this week. A senior police officer is currently conducting a review into the investigation, but it hasn't yet been officially dropped. Andrew, what are your thoughts on this case? I think it's fairly astonishing. And what I'm particularly troubled about is that whenever we have one of these sort of free speech issues that happens, and then we say where this can lead, we point out that this is a kind of slippery slope. Well, then we're accused of of indulging in that slippery slope fallacy. You know, one thing doesn't necessarily lead to the other. However, every time one of these things happen, it's evidence that in fact, this is the case. You know, back when we had the infamous Nazi pug case with uh, Marcus Meekin, who was uh, prosecuted for teaching his girlfriend's pug dog to do a Nazi salute as a joke and was ultimately convicted in a court of law of inciting hate. Everyone said, well, yes, but he's just someone on YouTube. That's not going to affect real, no real comedians going to be, no professional comedians going to be investigated for hate speech. Mm. And then Joe Brand was in fact investigated by the police for a joke. And then they said, oh yeah, but you know, this, this is just a one-off. It's not going to affect journalists or anything. And now you have a journalist being investigated by the police for interviewing someone and for that person saying something inflammatory. So what we are seeing is in fact evidence as we go along that this these things do escalate. And actually, when it comes to free speech, you do have to be extremely vigilant. It isn't something that you can just let go and, and think, well, we've won that and that's going to be safe forevermore. But it's actually something you have to fight for in every successive generation. And I think this sort of shows that. And in terms of uh, uh, Darren Grimes, I mean, the whole uh, investigation has been a, a complete mess anyway, because when it was announced that Darren Grimes was being investigated, I did think, well, hold on a minute, 
why have they skipped out Starkey in that case? Well, it turns out they did email Starkey's think tank, but the think tank just assumed it was a practical joke and ignored it. I mean, the whole thing has been so botched anyway. But there's two issues. I mean, firstly, Starkey shouldn't be investigated either. He's he's allowed to say whatever he likes in a free country, and we may not like what he's got to say, but that is the price you pay for freedom. And certainly, Darren Grimes shouldn't be investigated for simply interviewing. It sets an incredibly dangerous precedent for anyone who wants to work in journalism and perhaps wants to explore contentious issues or talk to controversial people. What's been interesting is that across the board, everyone has kind of recognised that this is a problem. You know, even people like Ash Sarkar have said, you know, this this isn't good. So I, th- I think there's a kind of consensus on that, which is which is a good thing. But I do think we are at risk of being complacent. The reason why these things keep getting worse and worse is that we are complacent about it and just assume they're one-offs and just mm. assume that they're not going to get any worse. And yet every single time they do. Ella? I agree with that. I mean, when it comes to your a kind of assessment of what actually was said in the podcast, there's two ways of looking at it. Either Darren Grimes, who's a, you know, young in the game, was naive, didn't do his research and was, as he has described it, ill prepared for the kind of crap that Starkey came out with, quite frankly, when he was talking about the damn blacks. Or he knew that David Starkey was someone controversial who rubs people up the wrong way, if you're putting it lightly, um, and wanted to include that phrase and that little snippet in order to get clicks. But whichever way you look at it and whichever version you believe, it's absolutely no business of the police. That's the bottom line. It doesn't matter that whether you think Starkey was racist, whether you think he has a point, none of the content of the actual interview is important when it comes to assessing the role of the police in this. And, you know, as a journalist, it sends shivers up your spine because I can think of numerous interviews I've done where people have said stuff that I find appalling where for the tactics of an interview, you might let them run on with their rubbish, either Mm. to get them to hang themselves with their own rope or to reveal something different. And if you don't have the ability to do that, it seriously hampers the toolkit you have as a journalist. It's quite frankly, just a freedom of the press issue, straightforwardly. It also brings up the question of what role we think journalism plays as a sort of more broader point there's a kind of worrying trend now to see journalism as a kind of activism. You know, it has to be moral. It has to have a political message. It has to have the right political message. It has to chime in with what's deemed to be the acceptable political view of the time. It's no longer about getting to the truth of the matter or about even putting forward a polemic, looking deeper at issues, all these things that you might get taught at journalism school or once upon a time got towards journalism school doesn't seem to matter anymore and the problem with that is you end up having a press which is informally or formally if the police get involved regulated by a small section of political activists it's there's no scope for maneuver there's no scope for even things like exposés the ramifications of this move by the police are really quite serious and it's you have to remind people who get upset by characters like Darren Grimes, characters like David Starkey, people who you might disagree with politically, is that it's never the kind of mild-mannered interviews that get this kind of stick. It's never the kind of beige issues that test the limits of people's dedication to freedom of the press. It's always the outliers. And so it might feel like you're constantly having to defend people who might turn your stomach, but that's the task at hand when it comes to arguing for a free press. That's right. And I think that, you know, there really has to be some resistance to the idea that there can be some limit on the kind of people that journalists should speak to or journalists should give a platform to, you know, often often that phrase is used when people object to someone being interviewed. I mean, you know, in the past couple of years, we've seen various news channels interview ex-members of ISIS. The ISIS Beatles have done the interview rounds. Shamima Begum has done the interview rounds. I think that's part and parcel of a, of actually quite healthy and inquisitive media culture that even, you know, the literally the worst of the worst people, we are able to kind of interrogate their words and we are able to find out how do they, you know, account for themselves and their, and their actions. I think that's incredibly, incredibly important. And, you know, we would be in danger of losing that if the kind of offhand very nasty comments of a historian, of actually quite a mainstream historian, you know, mainstream television figure, were suddenly seen as so beyond the pale that they have to be criminalised. 
Mick Hume makes this point in Spike this week that what we're seeing is a widening of the definition of incitement, particularly incitement to hatred or incitement to violence, where, you know, people will often say, oh, you know, even if people agree that you have a right to offend as part of your right to free speech, people will say, well, you know, what about incitement? You know, you don't have a right to incite violence. But in a case like this, where incitement basically just means inflammatory or insulting or, or rude, then the bounds of what is acceptable to say are kind of just shrinking ever further. So we should look, as, as Mick suggests, to the to the US First Amendment. Obviously, we don't have this in Britain. We, free speech is not protected, unfortunately. We should stick to their definition of incitement, which means likely to produce imminent lawless action. And, you know, anything beyond that is censorship. Grimes is being investigated under the Public Order Act 1986 and the specific charges that he allowed David Star- oh, broadcast David Starkey, which was amounting to stirring up racial hatred. And as you say, the fact that we live in a country where if someone says something of the kind that Starkey said, there is an outcry, no one accepts it. You know, I mean, I'm actually struggling with how you could stir up racial hatred by something you say in this country. You know, I think you need very specific circumstances. You need to be somewhere like Weimar Germany or Rwanda, where, there, where there's a, an existing tension, there's existing mass prejudice. I don't think saying something racist in this country even amounts to stirring up racial hatred because what happens when you say something racist in a, in a tolerant country like ours is you are criticized, roundly mocked, you lose all respect, you make yourself unemployable. Mm. We quite rightly don't tolerate racism in this country. So I don't even think the term stirring up racial hatred is applicable to people saying racist things in the context of the UK in 2020. There's also a real double standards going on because if you remember the mess of the incident that happened around the new, that new statesman interview with Roger Scruton, for example, mm. which turned out to be problematic for a whole different set of reasons. But the, the sort of desire by that journalist was to pin Roger Scruton as someone who had said appalling and racist things. And there was sort of applause from lots of people on Twitter who have criticized Grimes of saying, look how well you've revealed the ignorance of Scruton. You know, what what a fantastic journalist you are. He put a picture up on Instagram of him popping champagne. There's no question of that stirring up racial hatred. So, it, you know, if you are Grimes, you must be feeling that there is a, something particular about him and his political viewpoint that's come into this that hasn't applied to previous journalists. The way to regulate things like this when it comes to the press is that if Darren Grimes releases a podcast that has obviously not got a very huge amount of research behind it and puts out controversial views just for the sake of putting out controversial views in the same way that the New Statesman article turned out to be inaccurate. The way to deal with it is that readers decide or listeners decide to stop going to that publication. It is not the business of the police to crack down on it, but it's the public who decides, especially when it comes to the press, what is okay and what isn't. And, you know, this is how publications and podcasts and videos rise and fall. That's how it should be. There's a sense of pride that comes with being able to talk confidently and intelligently about a subject, or to be the only one at a pub quiz who knows the right answer. That's one reason I love The Great Courses Plus. With this streaming service, I have the freedom to learn more about virtually any topic, and not just the basics, but to truly master it. You're learning from the unique perspectives of top engaging experts in their fields, You can get unlimited access to thousands of lectures on topics like modern political tradition, exploring the cosmos, even writing fiction or Mediterranean cooking. And the best part is that with the Great Courses Plus app, I have the flexibility to watch or listen to these courses just about anywhere. One course I'd recommend is An Economic History of the World Since 1400. It traces the story of the global economy all the way from agrarian societies to the complexities of today's global market. We're currently living through one of the most extreme economic events in history, so what better time to look back at the peaks and troughs of the past to learn what caused them and how we get out of them. Get that awesome feeling of pride that comes with knowledge by signing up for The Great Courses Plus. They're offering Spike Podcast listeners an entire month of unlimited access for free. To start your free month trial, sign up today using our special URL. Sign up now at thegreatcoursesplus.com slash spiked. Remember, thegreatcoursesplus.com slash spiked. (laughs) 
lockdowns around the world have been justified on the basis of the science. But a group of eminent infectious disease experts think that lockdown is doing more harm than good. Those experts recently came together to sign the Great Barrington Declaration. It calls for an end to lockdown and for what they call focused protection, devoting more resources to protecting the vulnerable. One of the three main signatories is Martin Kulldorff, Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School. I started off by asking him what compelled him to sign the Great Barrington Declaration. The media sort of says that there is scientific consensus for lockdown and contact tracing, even though among the colleagues that I talk to personally, we have a different view. There's actually two concerns. One is the collateral damage on other aspects of public health. And one of the basic principles of public health is you don't just look at one disease. You have to look at health as a whole, all kinds of diseases, the whole population and both current time and future time. And that's not what's been done with COVID-19. So that's sort of stunning as a public health science to see that people are looking very focused on one disease in very short term. So that's one reason. And I think the collateral damage is very tragic. Cardiovascular disease outcomes are are worse. Uh, Cancer screenings are down and that doesn't affect things now. But if you don't do, for example, cervical cancer screening now, nobody's going to die this year from it. But instead of surviving 15 to 20 years, somebody will live maybe only three to four years. So that's not in the statistics yet, but it was something we live with with the future. But then even if we just look at COVID, the approach doesn't make sense. So flattening the curve back in the spring we had to do that so we didn't uh, overload the hospitals. And that succeeded, I think, in almost every country. But trying to suppress the disease with contact tracing and testing and isolation together with severe lockdown, that's not going to solve it. It will just push things, things in the, into the future. So how should we be dealing with the virus instead? We should not do nothing. So we shouldn't just let it rip through uh, society. But we shouldn't do a general lockdown either because we're just pushing it forward. If everybody is at the same risk, we will still have a lot of old people and a lot of young people to get the disease. And a lot of the old people will die because they are high risk. So the key to minimize mortality, not in the short term, but in the long term, uh, throughout the pandemic, by the time the pandemic ends, is to what we in the Great Barrington Declaration call focused protection which we focus the protection on the high-risk individuals, and we know who they are. And then we let children and young people live their lives normally. They should still wash their hands and stay home when they are sick and those things, but to live life normally with in-person teaching in both schools and universities, restaurants opening, they should do sports, cultural things, and so on. What happens then is if we do better protect, and we have to do a better protection than we've done now for the, for the elderly high-risk groups. If we do that, then we're going to have many younger people who get infected, but we will have very few older people. There will still be some because we can't protect people 100%, but there will be much fewer. And if we can <laughs> shift that balance about who gets infected from evenly distributed, from being fewer old people and more younger people, then we're going to drastically reduce mortality. We all know that it's a difference in risk between age, but it's not just like a, like a two-fold or five-fold or even ten-fold excess risk. It's not even a hundred-fold. The difference in risk between the oldest and the youngest is more than a thousand-fold. So uh, COVID-19 is our enemy. And if you have an enemy, you have to uh, utilize sort of the weaknesses of the enemy. And the weaknesses of COVID-19 is that it's not a dangerous disease for children and young adults. For children, COVID-19 is much less dangerous than the annual flu. One example of that is from Sweden, who was the only country who kept schools open throughout the height of the pandemic in the spring. They were home if they got sick, they could cough or that, but no masks and no social distancing. Of the 1.8 million children, there were exactly zero deaths of COVID during this period. And among the 1.8 million children, there were a few hospitalizations, uh, but not a lot. So much milder than the annual flu, which in the United States kills between 200 and 1,000 children every year 
depending on the severity of the disease, it varies from year to year. Sometimes you have a bad flu season and sometimes it's milder. You've talked about the risks COVID poses to different age groups, but is it not also true that the lockdown is affecting different groups in different ways? You know, the pain is unevenly distributed. That's certainly true. And the lockdown is a double whammy for the working class. So if you start with the COVID, what we're doing now, we are protecting low-risk college students and low-risk professionals who can work from home, like bankers and uh, journalists like you and scientists like me, while uh, older working-class people still have to go to work because they have to make a living, whether they do a bus driver or they're a janitor or they work uh, in a supermarket. So uh, we are basically throwing the working class under the bus, protecting Mm -hmm. those of us who are more privileged in society. The working class is carrying the burden of generating the immunity that eventually will protect all of us. But of course, the the lockdown is also uh, hurting uh, the working class more because those of us who can work from home, we are not losing our jobs. But if you work as a waiter in a restaurant, you will maybe lose their jobs. So uh, the working class has much of a less of a safety net. So a more privileged could take a financial hit for a while, but the working class doesn't have that luxury. Have people lost sight of the bigger picture, do you think? There, there seems to be very little concern about what the current measures might mean in 10 years' time, say. And there doesn't even seem to be any consideration of how we've dealt with public health emergencies in the past. Are we losing a sense of perspective here? It's a unique new experiment, and it's a terrible experiment. As a public health scientist, I'm stunned, and so are many of my colleagues. By focusing so singularly on one disease uh, in the short term, we are throwing all the principles of public health out the window. And it's interesting, if you go back, most countries in Europe have a pandemic preparedness plan. They didn't recommend lockdowns. They recommended risk-based strategy to protect those at high risk which is actually uh, the same as the focus prevention that we are proposing in the Great Barrington Declaration. So what we are proposing is nothing uh, revolutionary or amazing or new novel things. Many people have been advocating for this throughout this pandemic, but hasn't really been paid much attention to it. So as a public health scientist, and this is not just me, this is also my colleagues, it's completely stunning to see how society has reacted to this pandemic. I just wanted to take a quick moment to tell you about Harry's. One thing that's great about Harry's is the smoothness of the shave. Even if I've left it a bit too long between shaves, I know that with Harry's, I'll still get a smooth and satisfying shave. The Harry's story begins with Jeff and Andy, two ordinary guys who were fed up with overpriced razors. They started Harry's to fix shaving. Harry's knew there was only one way to ensure quality, so they bought their own factory in Germany that's been making blades for a hundred years. They've now released their sharpest ever blades and added a new lubricating strip for an ever closer, more comfortable shave. The best part, they haven't raised prices, so replacement blades are still as little as £1.75 each. Want to give Harry's a go? Start your subscription with a trial set. It includes everything you need. A weighted ergonomic handle, their new five-blade razor cartridge, a rich lathering shave gel, and a travel blade cover. Get started shaving with Harry's today by claiming your trial set for just £3.95. Support our podcast and get your trial set delivered to you, including a razor handle, five blade cartridge, foaming shave gel and travel blade cover by going to harrys.com slash spiked right now. That's harrys.com slash spiked. Twitter does not like it when users satirise woke politics. The latest account to be purged from Twitter was Jarvis Dupont, an upper-class hipster university student riddled with white guilt, who recently transitioned. It was run by Lisa Graves, who also co-wrote a character called Godfrey Elfwick, a genderqueer Muslim atheist who was banned from Twitter a few years ago. Other anti-woke satire from fake news website The Babylon Bee to our own Andrew Doyle's Titania McGrath have landed in hot water with the Twitter morality police over the years. Andrew, you wrote about this story this week. First of all, tell us a bit about Jarvis 
and then why you think he offended uh, Twitter's censors. Well, Jarvis DuPont's a relatively recent account that Lisa Graves set up about a year ago, or a bit more actually, about a year and a half. And initially, Jarvis was a kind of woke hipster, very rich, very privileged guy who is crippled with white guilt. Uh, there's one tweet thread she put out about how he described being in pret a one day and being overcome with white guilt all of a sudden as he was eating a, a muffin. And so he goes over to the nearest black family and gives them his half-eaten muffin and says, this is for slavery. And that's the kind of character he is. But then about three or four months ago, what she decided was that he would transition into a female because, of course, part of being part of that woke group is that you need some victim points. And Mm. and she she said that she felt that was the best way that he could do that. Of course, he doesn't really have an interest in transitioning to female. He just adds a bit of lipstick and and just talks about how he likes to go shopping and likes to wear shoes. So in other words, he embodies all those gender stereotypes uh, that a lot of feminists are worried about, the fact that those are being rehabilitated in the name of trans activism. So that's the kind of thing she was tapping into. And that's the point at which the ban hit. However, what I will say is that when Jarvis DuPont was initially banned, there were about 10 or 11 other satirical accounts that all mocked social justice, the social justice movement, and they were all banned within the same hour on the same afternoon by Twitter. So the idea that all of these accounts had simultaneously violated the terms of Mm. service at exactly the same time strikes everyone as as unlikely to say the least. The problem with Twitter is, of course, it's such a shady operation. They completely lack transparency. You've no way of knowing what you've done wrong. Anyone who's ever been banned by Twitter will know that what happens is you get an automated message which tells you that you violated the terms of service. And when you reply and you say, well, what have I actually done? You just get another automated message saying you have violated the terms of service. In other words, you've committed a crime, but they're not going to tell you what the crime is. You'll all know the novel The Trial by Kafka, (laughs) in which that exactly happens. He doesn't ever find out what the crime is that he is ultimately... Oh, I won't tell you what happens at the end, but you know what happens at the end. (laughs) Anyway, so that's basically... The problem with Twitter, I mean, normally I'd say it's possible that they were just taking it seriously or that the algorithms, you know, they'd been picked up on the algorithms. But unfortunately, the fact that so many satirical accounts were were banned at the same time and they were all mocking a particular ideological worldview, coincidentally, the worldview that 99% of Twitter staff hold, uh, I think we have to join the dots there, don't we? Mm. And I think it's it's worth reflecting on the fact that wokeness is the ideology of Silicon Valley. That's what I often find so perplexing because we often talk about this kind of social justice movement and everyone says it's a a movement of the left or even a movement of the oppressed or, and things like that. But this is the belief system of, of the new elites, the people who hold sway over the kind of information we're allowed to consume and things like that. It's the movement of the powerful. You know, it, it, it's hilarious to me. One of the reasons why the social justice movement is so funny is that they're talking about being the rebels and the resistance and the, and the minority and the underdogs, but they are supported by all major corporations corporations, all of Silicon Valley, most of the media, absolutely all the hefty people with cultural clout are behind them. You're not, you're not the underdog in that circumstance, I'm afraid. Ella? Well, this is the difficult thing about Twitter, because on the one hand, you'd like to, you know, and people do say, oh, it's just Twitter. You know, why are you so, oh, if it gets banned off Twitter, what's the problem? You can go and do this elsewhere. And it's a social media platform. What's the big deal? But if you look in terms of where do, especially during coronavirus, where do politicians do most of their kind of engagement with the public? It's on Twitter. You know, you most often, especially in the UK, find MPs tweeting rather than engaging with their constituents. A huge amount, if not all of political campaigning now happens on Twitter rather than there's sort of as, again, especially under coronavirus, there's no leafleting on the local street. It's all online. And so it's quite clear that Twitter has become this relatively important part of people's lives, especially if you are involved in politics. It's where it all happens. And so any kind of censorship, especially for political reasons, whether it's Jarvis or whoever else sort of sinning against the what's politically correct at the time, is a big problem because it means this isn't a free public space. And it impinges on people's ability to engage in public life in a way that isn't constrained. I mean, the other thing that I'm really worried about is this kind of celebration of being literal. I mean, Andrew, you'll know more about this in terms of what it does for satire, killing off satire and the ability to be satirical completely. But a pedant, someone who's literal all the time, who takes things literally, is probably one of the worst personality traits. It is It is so awful and boring and annoying. And this is now being 
celebrated as you know the only means through which you can engage in people. I mean, it really takes an idiot to look at an account like Jarvis DuPont and not even something in the back of their head say, there's something going on here. Is this really real? I mean, not least because the picture was like, you know, it's like a made up, pix obviously pixelated, not a real person. But then the more serious element of that is, it's not that people don't believe that this is real. I mean, Andrew, actually, you mentioned in your piece on Spiked that the Pink News picked up this spat between Lawrence Fox and Jarvis Dupont and treated, even though they knew that Jarvis Dupont was fictional, treated the situation as if he was real. It's not about people not believing it. It's about this idea that even when someone is taking the piss online, that can be construed as harmful enough to be removed. Even joking online, even, you know, when everyone is in on the joke, it's still not allowed. And that's an indictment on the audience on Twitter and the public for being able to engage in these kinds of things and make up their own minds. So this is always, as you've pointed out many times, less to do with the actual offending Twitter themselves and more to do with the rest of us and what we'll do and what effect it will have on us looking at it. So if Jarvis DuPont says something appalling, we're all going to out, go out and be appalling on the street ourselves, which is the kind of elitism that doesn't get called out enough in these discussions. That's why the Pink News, actually, they said that uh, Lawrence Fox had misgendered a fictional trans woman. <laughs> so that's what they were outraged about. And th because they believe that even to do that in a fictional context is to spread harm and spread hate. And as you say, Ella, the populace are just this sort of malleable group of drones who are waiting for these dog whistles and these signals to just react like robots. It's absolute in insanity. And what you say is absolutely right about this literal mindedness that is so embedded in the woke movement, in the social justice movement. It, it means that you don't understand the arts. It means you can't interpret a film or a book. That's why they're constantly going after comedy shows on Netflix, for instance, you know, or movies that they think transgress certain boundaries or represent people in quote unquote the wrong way. It's because they are simply ill-equipped to understand art and how to interpret art. So all of that's really, really makes me nervous. But the other thing is it's not just about satirical accounts. I mean, you know, my satirical account could get nuked tomorrow and it's not the end of the world in the grand scheme of things. It's part of a broader pattern on Twitter. I mean, it, just today we've had the news that the New York Post, uh, anyone mm. who was sharing the story about Hunter Biden, that Twitter was just preventing you from sharing that that link. Even the New York Post itself couldn't publish their own article on Twitter because it was prevented by Twitter themselves. Donald Trump's press secretary was locked out of her account just for sharing the story. Now, whatever you think about the story, that's an incredible encroachment on press freedom. But not only that, that is Twitter taking a specifically partisan political line in the run-up to the election. So this stuff really does matter. Thanks for listening to the Spike podcast. We'll be back next week. If you enjoyed the show, why not check out some of Spike's other podcasts in the meantime? We have the Brendan O'Neill show in which Spike's editor talks all about the big ideas, bad ideas, problems and controversies of life in the 21st century, all with the help of an esteemed guest. Then there's Culture Wars hosted by Spike's columnist, stand-up comic and satirist Andrew Doyle. This monthly podcast is the perfect antidote to the woke idiocy taking over our lives. And last but not least, you should check out Last Orders, a podcast hosted by Tom Slater and Chris Snowden. Last Orders is all about freedom, the nanny state and censorship. And there's a lot about coronavirus these days too. You can listen to all these shows with your favourite podcast provider, or you can find them on the Spiked website at spiked-online.com. Thanks for listening. See you next week.